So today is March 5th, 2018, and we're here with Mrs. Marguerite G. Royce. My name is Chris Chan, and with me I have Daniel Ngo. Um, so let's begin. Uh, we're going to first start off with um, your childhood and your family. Um, so can, can, can you start off with your date of birth and talk a little bit about your family and your siblings? Okay. Um, I was uh, born on June 13th, 1944, and I am the youngest of uh, 12 children. And, um, you know, now I look back, I think of my childhood years uh, as uh, my happiest years. Uh, there, my oldest sister, Daisy, was 22 years older than I. And then there was Ruby, two years younger. And uh, uh, number three was George, four years younger. And... Uh, then Robert, two years younger, David, two years younger, Mamie, two years younger, uh, Mary Ann, about a year and a half younger, and I think a year and a half between Mary Ann and my twin brothers, uh, Joe and John, and, uh, and maybe about maybe two years uh, between the twins and brother Tom. And then that's two years um, between uh, Tom and Brother Alfred, and I'm the last. And then there were three years between me and um, um, my last brother. And um, you know, there were, were happy times. In, un, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you're, un, unfortunately, my, my eldest sister, who also is older, old enough to be my mother, but uh, she took care of me. Um, she died tragically in childbirth in Houston at the age of about 27, which was a, a shock. So I only have, you know, young memories of her, and, and, and they were good because she was like my protective mother. But then um, the rest of my uh, uh, siblings were with me uh, a long time, so I have, a, I have memories of each of them. You know, and big family. Some you're closer than others, <laughs> and um, we just uh, yeah, go, going most up in Houston. Uh, it was a good family period, and we had family dinners and lots of get-togethers and lots of friends. And our house was very open to people. Chinese coming from uh, anywhere, particularly in the south, where my uh, my parents had been uh, in Lake Village, Arkansas, where the first um, nine were born, uh, ten were born. And so you used to see so people from those families and friends of friends who came to Houston were welcome. So it was a very open uh, a period for me. And Would you say you were um, kind of brought up by your siblings, your elder siblings, um, or uh, how, how would you describe your relationship uh, with your parents uh, versus your siblings as the youngest of, mm -hmm. of, of 12? Well, I, I realized my mother was older, you know, for a mother. And uh, I saw, because I had to, uh, my first language actually was Chinese, so it's the youngest, so she uh, kept me close to her. And um, I used to actually uh, sleep with her uh, in, on the bed as a child. And, but I, and once I started school, I, I realized that, but fortunately I'm gonna be candid, uh, that she was old fashioned and she was old country and the only spoke uh, Chinese and that's why her English was uh, always poor. My father had uh, uh, spoken uh, better in English. In fact, he was bilingual. He could read the Chinese dailies and the English uh, American uh, newspapers. So, there was good memories of my eldest uh, sister, who was protected even until she died. And uh, uh, I wasn't as close to my, my, my second eldest sister, who was a little more stern with me. Because I was, I was spoiled, too. I was the last to come, or come uh, along. And that, I was su surprised. My, and they were, they were always joking. My brothers would say things like, call me the mistake. <laughs> they didn't, I wasn't planned or anything. Um, 
So it was just, a, I guess, sort of a, a, a the values that my parents uh, had were passed on to me, uh, the old fashion to uh, be polite and try not to be, uh, and to your elders and uh, try not to talk unless spoken to and, um, you know, just act as, as, as you, maybe in a way as reticent as you can be. But see, I was a young child and I was, uh, at the same time, I was, I was allowed to be very free. So uh, I did speak my mind. So uh, it was just a combination of uh, the old, the older siblings um, uh, speaking to me, and when I when I really got out of line, telling me no, you, that you do not act that way. And uh, yeah. so I think I had the basic values, but I was allowed a lot of freedom to uh, to uh, uh, yeah, to open up and and and. and uh, express myself. How did your I, parents uh, spoil you? Oh, I, I don't know. It, uh, uh, I never felt I was that spoiled. My my older brothers felt that I was a spoiled. And, um, I don't know. It's just that when my brothers would sort of pick on me, uh, I would be running, and 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 my mother would, you know, grab grab me and hold me into her, and and then she fuss and chide my brothers, don't you treat them that mm -hmm. way, uh, as um, in, in Chinese. It was always Chinese from her, and, her. and so. But then I got berated too. But you don't. <laughs> it was back and forth. Uh, but I think the fact is that I was just allowed as a last child to be so free and open and, and say what was on my mind until I crossed the line. Um, I think that might, because I think my older sisters were raised uh, to be more polite and, and, and reserved. Mm -hmm. And why do you think that was just because they, your, your mother was younger at the time, or was the changing values of society a factor? Uh, I'm not really sure. It could be, you know, when they're older, the, the parents uh, do uh, treat the uh, uh, elder siblings as, as stricter and let them, but um, it, that, that might have been in. And then, uh, and then uh, uh, enduring stay in the United States and realize that, you know, this was the American way of life, and of course she's going to, you know, to, to uh, be uh, American. You know, I think my parents entertained the thought the one time that they could uh, do well here financially or something and take the family back to China. And she would talk about it sometimes when I was young, but that did not become realistic because we were Americans and we were, uh, uh, we had American values and we would have we would have, uh, you know, never, never fit in. Uh, how old was your mother when you were born? Uh, I, I think the birth certificate says that she was uh, about 47. But I'm going to say, I tend to think they were both maybe two years older. There wasn't always, you know, documented proof yeah. of their birth. So I think they had a tendency to, to feel a bit on, on the ages, and then, t you know, they took, uh, you know, the hospital and everything, doctors took their word. And uh, so, um, yeah, so I, I think she was closer to 49, you know, if, she, if she was, because I was sort of a change of, you know, a, 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 a you know, what do you call it, a baby, a late baby, as, as her, her system was changing into menopause. So I think that's why I was surprised. <laughs> so you think, um, you know, when they, when they fib a bit about their age, it, it would be to have a younger age as opposed to an older age? Yeah, it would be, yes. Because they realized they were older parents, and, mm -hmm. you know, particularly uh, being I, number 12, being born. Uh, what memories do you have of your father? Okay, uh, my, they're, they're good. Uh, uh, my father, though, already, um, he died uh, when I was 10. So according to that uh, birth certificate, something was 74. I tend to think he was more like 76. Um, he, he was this grandfatherly 
man and always smiling and talking, wore glasses, read his um, his uh, daily papers, Chinese and English, drank coffee in the morning, and you know that's how he started his day. And and uh, I remember as a child being, you know, when when he's affectionate being pulled in between his legs while he's there and just being held. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know there, was, there was love there. Uh, but, I, but in time, I realized that, gee, I'm seeing other people. Gee, he's old enough to be like other people's grandfather. And I realized that later. Uh, but he was, and he was highly regarded in the community because he was uh, a generous, kind man, very sociable. And even by American, you know, uh, Caucasian neighbors in the house, he was the friendly Chinese man on the block, and generous about giving both my parents because we planted uh, all the Chinese vegetables behind the house because at that time we didn't have a Chinatown to go to get all the fresh produce, so all the Chinese vegetables. And that was a part of buying the house in Houston. How good was the soil? Because they were going to be planting all the vegetables. So he would share all that, you know, things that the, that the um, neighbors liked, and also give roses from our uh, rose uh, when, when they bloomed. But I know he was so uh, uh, generous because I uh, later I heard the stories where he loaned money to Chinese coming to this country. And it, sometimes it was, it was never repaid. But he never, you know, he forgave. He didn't, you know, make a big deal about it. Because I think um, generosity and uh, goodness is part of, are part of it. So I think that was passed down to, uh, to us. Did he ever, Better to give than to always receive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did he ever teach you any lessons that, you know, like generosity? Um, do you remember him saying any sayings that you still remember and keep close to heart? The, not that, because both of them led by example. That's how you, you see how, how they treat others. But uh, he would say... Uh, he knew education was important for us to be successful in this country, and he says, you go to school, you make good grades, you know, you study hard, you be a good girl, you be a good student. So they know, they knew that A's and B's were good, and that A's were the best, you know, straight A's. And one time I got a C. <laughs> I think it was something in attendance, uh, when I said so, or they would grade you on your behavior, and I wasn't paying attention. I got a C, and my mother saw it on the report card, and she got angry. But I still had an A average, because <laughs> I did well in the subjects. But here we were, here was, you know, she moves in and out of her seat, she talks, so she's going to get a C for not staying in her seat. <laughs> so. Do you speak to your parents in Chinese or English or both? Okay, they're going, I don't speak, English is my first and only language now. It was, it was Cantonese, it was more of a sort of village dialect, dialect. you know, uh, say, uh, um, uh, dad was Toy San, and mom was from Hoi Ping, and it, I realized it was uh, uh, more of a country dialect, because uh, I had um, a sister-in-law who, who spoke more of the city uh, Cantonese dialect. No, as long as I um, was home, it was it was uh, a Chinese definitely to my mother, and and e even dad. But sometimes, you know, when he spoke English, you know, I, I could talk back to him in English. Um, and uh, you see, that's that's how I lost my Chinese. Once once I moved away, uh, I moved away um, in '69 to Honolulu, Hawaii. And so each time I would come home, my mother would notice that my Chinese was poor. So eventually, and then when, uh, then when my mother died in 72, after that, um, I just uh, um, started really losing my Chinese. And then there was, you know, there was also pressure to, to um, improve my English 
to help me uh, career-wise. And particularly, I was in journalism and English. Um, I, I felt I had to have high standards of uh, speaking English. Okay. Um, what about um, your siblings? Do you communicate with them in English? Or at, and when you were young, did you ever talk to them in uh, Taizai? It was rare because we were, were uh, so I'm the last, and they've all pretty much gone through the schooling. And so uh, we were, no, it was mostly English. We, they, uh, it only was in, within the house and speaking with our mother mainly uh, that we spoke Chinese as it, uh, we could. And then to her, but sometimes, you know, you start speaking English that she doesn't always understand certain things. So, yeah, yeah, it's always, so it's only, yeah, it's only English now. We were very Americanized, yeah. Which um, sibling do you think you're closest with? Uh, I have, uh, it would be, I do, there are my two older sisters um, that, um, that who are quite different. We're all, we're all quite different in our personalities. But uh, I think I probably admire my eldest brother, George, um, the most. So he was, um, he was more like in my father's image, um, very responsible, uh, member of the community, um, sociable, um, respected people. He, uh, people would you know, take to his personality. He was just such a nice man. But uh, you know, he, he what he said. You, you you took him at his word, and um, yes, yeah, and and because as a, the big brother, uh, when my father died, he had to take over the business, and he had been going to uh, college. He had got, he had been going to the early days of U of H. It was a university, and it was Cougar College or something. And he had to drop out, so he sacrificed his uh, college career to take over the family grocery business and help, you know, secure, um, you know, the financial health for, for the rest of us. And um, and he uh, he just started. I think he's he's preceded me. He's, he's, you've done an interview with him, George G. Hmm. So uh, he he died at eighty five and twenty. Uh, Thirteen. Did you ever um, help out with the the store, the grocery store, when you were young? Oh, exactly. We all had to work. That's the strong work ethic, and uh, everybody, because that's that's how we made. You had to put in your hours at the store, and after after school, yeah, you, know, you had to get your studies in, but you had, you had to work. And um, as the youngest, they had me. Uh, uh, Stacking canned goods, like at the age of three, four, you know, I, you may not, may not remember, you young, you young guys, but there were these little pet milk cans and things like that. They were small, and the, you would put them on the lower shelf, and they would open a case for me, and they say, "Okay, you stack them." They would give me tests like that, and then as I got over, by the time I was nine, I was um, cashiering. And by the time I was uh, 12, I was sort of a junior cashier helping my sister. And uh, you know, these are days of the oh, uh, uh, you know, it's the, anyway, it's the, it's the immigrant story of, of the, you know, subsequent co uh, Koreans and and the Vietnamese who start you know owning these 7-Eleven stores. But those days, um, our, our family grocery store. You didn't have the benefits of uh, uh, the mechanization of uh, of pricing. You know, you had to know the price of every item, and you had to, um, you know, in and uh, <laughs> and work the cash register. Do you remember some of the prices? Oh, things were cheap. Uh, uh, small loaf of bread, um, seventeen to twenty-one cents. Maybe, uh, gee, what was milk? I don't know. Uh, it's, it was, yeah. Uh, oh, milk, maybe, in a, uh, 
quart or something, 10 cents, something like that. Um, it's, this is, don't take for accuracy, uh, uh, but you know, much less. And, and even cigarettes. Um, and at that time, I was allowed to sell the cigarettes under age, or at least they never came and check up on it. Yeah, oh, oh, oh God, well, cigarettes at that time might have been um, around less than a dollar, about a dollar or something. Yeah. What was the most expensive thing that you sold at the store? It's really, I'm trying to hard to think about. It's, it, it, it could have been, I don't know. I thought it maybe it could have been in in the, the drug department, in where, where they were, and um, I can't think what little uh, uh, maybe some some drug items, uh, but nothing really uh, you know um, stands out to me. These uh, um, beauty products that were on the line back there. Um, yeah, they tend the the, the the items back there tend to be more expensive. Otherwise, you know, it's produce and groceries and and the meat. Oh, of course, your your uh, your steak, your well, uh, your top grade steaks would be cost more a pound. But my guys, that's that's nothing. <laughs> it's steak for a uh, dollar, two dollars, something like that. You know, things like that that product, but. Um, and uh, uh, nothing, no one item stands out in my mind as uh, something terribly expensive. Uh, did you get paid? No. <laughs> we didn't really get salaries. See, we, uh, money was given to us as needed for school expenses. Uh, food was always there. Uh, lunch, you know, lunch was uh, uh, plentiful because there was food, and Mama would make sandwiches every day. Uh, it wasn't until I was probably in high school that I could get a little more change and go through the cafeteria and i get 25 cents or something. You could get a whole meal for 25 cents. But even so, with our diet, um, I could take pork chop sandwiches to school, meat sandwiches. Now, the standard sandwich for an American Caucasian kid was peanut butter and jelly. And that's what they had all the time. So occasionally I would trade off my meat sandwich to get peanut butter and jelly. I had no idea about the prices. It was so different. So things like that, they were, you know, com common. <laughs> no, food food was never a problem. We, um, that, that was important to, uh, to us. Chinese, eat well, feed your family. And we would take the, my brothers all knew how to butcher, so they would bring home the top grades of the beef to cook at home. Yeah, premium. What, what kinds of um, dinner foods did you eat at home? <laughs> it would always be a combination American Chinese. Uh, we, had right, a pot of, uh, we had a pot of white rice going the whole day, whether it was in the house, or at the store, well, see behind the store there was this kitchen, mm -hmm. and when, where we would take our breaks and we would eat. So uh, it would, yeah, it, it, m m mom could make you know any kind of stir fry chicken, beef, pork from the vegetables in the garden. It, or mom learned how to make very good southern fried chicken. We would have that. Uh, and, uh, uh, and as I get pork chops, just cooked American way. Um, uh, my mother learned how to make good um, sweet potato pies, which is another a southern delicacy. And we, we you know, we, we could have corn, can, uh, canned corn. We didn't grow on corn, uh, and, and corn off the cob. Everything, is, whatever it was, whatever the meat or, or chicken was, was the main entree. It would be complemented with white rice and a Chinese vegetable, at least one green Chinese vegetable, and sometimes corn. What kinds of Chinese vegetables did you guys um, sell at the store and grow? Well, for, I'll tell you, uh, at that time, you didn't, 
have Chinese vegetables at our store because um, our, uh, our clientele, we were in the, a black neighborhood, uh, the Fifth Ward, and so uh, they would be more uh, American vegetables. It would be your broccoli, it would be your, uh, uh, um, it, oh, it would be your cabbage, it would be um, collard greens, it would be mustard greens, very uh, southern uh, uh, vegetables. Uh, but the vegetables came from the garden, so it's you know, everything bok choy. <laughs> I can't remember the uh, 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 guy uh, uh, uh every kind of, and what I'm saying, what, what is the choy? I can't. Remember. I see them when I go. Do you do you know a ranch market? Ninety nine yeah. ranch market. Yes. I see them when I go there, and I can't always remember the name of them, mm -hmm. but we had them. You know that we had most of those vegetables were growing, including the winter melon. Yeah. Did you know where your parents got the seeds for Chinese vegetables? Uh, it's so. Uh, I think it got to to people who were coming over and all from the village, who we made friends with and brought things. And then once you start it, like like when you do the bean sprouts, you just mm -hmm. yeah. that regenerates. So you save them. I think that's where they, so it's because when people were first coming over, you you could get, you know, uh, request these things, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you think your mother learned how to make southern specialties like pies and fried chicken? Oh, she just adapted. She just, I think she just observed, and she never took any formal cooking lessons. You know, she would she would see that, uh, and uh, occasionally we'd go out to um, American cafeterias, no, she just just saw that that chicken and uh, was popular of or fried chicken, and of course this was be before you had Kentucky Fried Chicken and Church's Fried Chicken, so yeah, she just knew she she learned. I think my mother dad she observed, and she just saw and she you know came with her own recipe and dipping it in flour, and I yeah those those things she, I think so, uh, I don't think anyone had really come and teach her. Did, um, did she interact with neighbors a lot? Uh, not a lot. Uh, she, she was a little more uh, reticent because I think um, uh, uh, she was aware that her English was poor. But, but, you know, that doesn't mean, you know, occasionally in giving things and all, uh, you know. And uh, also, you have to realize, uh, when um, we moved to our house, well, we'll go back, go back to when we had our first grocery store, which was in the black neighborhood. And that was the only way I interacted with uh, blacks because we were in that neighborhood and there was a family in the back who had a little black daughter who was a little younger than I because it was the days of segregation. So mm -hmm. I never saw them in school because, but they were our customs, customers. So that, so she did, there she was probably more reluctant and I have a feeling it's probably prejudice on, on her part. Um, but then we moved uh, into a house that uh, purchased before my father died into a, a, a labor class, a blue collar white neighborhood and it's, uh, I don't know how well you know Houston, northeast part of Houston. And it, um, when we first moved there, it was mostly whites, and of course I was going to school, so, so the neighbors around, uh, white families who were employed by the oil companies, but they tend to have blue collar jobs. But then it changed in, so there she would know some of the neighbors, and then it changed into, um, Latinos, Latin Americans, or are, are you do you, are you more familiar with the term Chicano? Which certainly, <laughs> yeah. what are the terms that we're using? I hear like Latino, Latino, Latino and Hispanic, yeah, Latino, probably. Chicano. Yeah, for Texas, a lot of big Chicano, Chicano and uh, California's Latinos. And so, and I think to that to this day, uh, it, that's still a neighborhood. In fact, uh, uh, um, after. Um, my, uh, you know, mother passed on. My one of my brothers 
took over the house with his wife and raised two sons there, and they expanded the house. And he, right now, and that brother has passed on, and his widow and his eldest son are, in fact, they were in town taking care of it because it's on the market, and there's a bid on it. So they plan to sell that house. So it's gone to second generation. So I would say, once the neighborhood started turning more uh, Latino, um, she was reluctant to, you know, get, get out as much. Did you interact with your neighbors when you were growing up? Uh, well, uh, when, I, I probably knew them all when they were white because we, I was still in school. But then about that time, you know, I was going off to college, so I wasn't living there. So I didn't know who these people were moving in, but you, just next door. We always knew there was some Latino family. So I was never around to to uh, really interact with them. And then I think uh, my brother John, who then moved and took the house, they got to know them, you know, better. Mm -hmm. But it was not like, um, you know, by the time everybody, uh, and uh, since, you know, kids were not going to school in, you know, the neighborhood, they would be transported out, you know, of the neighborhood, so. But for a period, and it wasn't until uh, really more junior high and high school that uh, I, we were in the, the white neighborhood, and I knew the neighbors because I was going to school with some of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd go spend, spend time on the porches and yeah. you know, visit and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Do you know if um, your family had trouble buying a house in a white neighborhood at that time? I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, uh, it was because I, I really don't know because uh, they, they there were these model homes that were, I which I thought were impressive because they one and a half story tall story homes and we could go look at them, and then they you know pointed it out that we're going to build that on our lot. We had a nice big corner lot. There was this old house there, wooden house that we first moved to. And uh, then the new house was uh, built uh, uh, to the right. That was a one and a half story. So it's, it's, a, it's a big lot now. And um, if I would think, say, building constructed on the lot, I, I would have hoped we didn't have any problem uh, at that time. What was the name of the grocery store that you first worked at, or your family's grocery store? Oh, the, the little one that we grew up in and uh, in the back of the house, um, that was Sunlight Grocery Store and Little Butt. Then we moved into a uh, uh, G and G food market on uh, Lyons Avenue. You know, at that time, the neighborhood was actually se uh, separated by the railroad tracks, so so the whites were on part of the railroad track, the working class whites that we moved into, and the other was still moving into the Fifth Ward, which is the black neighborhood. So that's where our store had to be. And so that market was a little larger. And then what happened is, uh, probably by that time, my older, uh, other, older siblings were going to college, and uh, I, I, we, yeah, I, we had moved into the house in the white neighborhood. So then, though, I had to go work in that store, G and G Food Mart, where I spent most of my working years from, uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, you know, it was only when I was small. I'm, I'm going to say eight, nine, on up to uh, close to eighteen when I continued working part time in the store. Um, how would you describe the, the differences between um, G and G Food Market at that time and the, the grocery stores that we have today? Oh, they're they are a small. Yes, yeah, it's a small. They're small uh, stores, but to me, it looked pretty big. Uh, you know, at the time, because it was larger than the little grocery store on Market where uh, I grew up behind, but. Um, I will only compare it to, in, uh, I live in uh, uh, California, and uh, not Southern California, but we, before we uh, moved to Southern California, um, we were in um, 
Northern California and living in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And there are these little community stores in the Berkeley neighborhoods that remind me uh, that are just for the people who live there. But even those, uh, uh, and, and many of them are run by Asians, uh, Chinese or, or Japanese. But even those, uh, and, and they cater just to the people in the neighborhood, um, even those are smaller than what we had. We had a, 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 a market that had oh, one, two, at least three aisles. And uh, you enter and cashier on the right and all the, the dry goods on the right, left produce and canned goods, and all the way back was uh, the meat market, where mm -hmm. things were all custom cut and for you. Uh, so it was very nice, but then you compare it to uh, a first, well, at that time, a first chain. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember. Wine Garden was a big chain. Have you heard of that store? Mm -hmm. Wine Garden? Yeah. Only through the archives. You did? Oh, <laughs> that's an old Jewish chain, yeah. And that, 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 it would be, yeah, Wine Garden come in. And uh, uh, so to go to that store uh, was something. And it was the Wine Garden when I first went into, I used to go there where I always remember the two water fountains, and one was for whites and one was for colored, and I knew that I could walk over the step to the white water, uh, water fountain and drink from it. And it was at Wine Gardens. So I saw how big, they were not really our competition because of our clientele were basically, basically uh, the blacks, so, um, African Americans in the neighborhood, who we were, who we really knew well, had relationships with, and we were, were really were protective of us. And we know, they would, <laughs> we, we let us know when things were, were, were not happening right, when the, when the, uh, the, um, the sale boys who would, um, would deliver our flyers to the neighborhood. Well, one time they just dumped them all in the ditch and they never got delivered. Well, they would get reported. And uh, people, our customers would tell us that, you know, you're, you know, they dumped your, and we knew who to, to reprimand, who was responsible for it. And, uh, and, and even there too, um, yeah, they were, they were Christian. They knew, um, particularly my brother George was very Christian. And, and extended credit to them. We had credit, and then the, they would pay the bills when their checks came in. And uh, the churches were around there too. So on church Sundays, people would come in. Well, you do you want? They're here. Do you want to order a Sunday fried chicken dinner with all of the trappings, mashed potatoes, mustard greens, and you would order these for like a dollar fifty. You would order one to three or how many as part, they were good, but that was all part of also maintaining a um, good relationship with the, the customers. Yeah, so we knew them all and they were, it was, you know, it was a good experience. Um, I felt safe and that's the only thing when you would know when you wouldn't have to get, you know, anyone who would look suspicious was, was an outsider because we did have some robberies in the old, in the old store, there were some robberies and it was always a stranger uh, coming in. You know, so. Have you experienced a robbery? N uh, not actually uh, in, in the ghost, it, it happened, uh, I, I remember it happened when my parents were both working and they would be taken advantage of. And I was little, and I, I didn't actually see it. You know, it would be after effects, and Dad would be running out. Oh, you know, he he, uh, he stole something, and you know, uh, you know gave, you had to give him a little money. It was never, I don't know how how really you know big it was. I mean, I guess you might have to pull out and give him some bills from the cash register. But it was always, you know, of course, it was always a stranger. It was it was not a regular customer, you know. But but they were they were few. It was just a handful, and that was the hard thing also too about maintaining good relationships with your uh, your customers and your community. Yeah. You know. What kind of employees did uh, your family hire for the the store? 
oh, they would always uh, 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 be black. Uh, they would be the baggers. And uh, those who, who uh, uh, deliver, delivered uh, the groceries, mm-hmm. yeah, we would hire, hire, yeah. And then when we would, uh, um, circulars, we'd hire them too, you know. There's a story uh, is that the, the, the two young men who we hired <laughs> uh, to uh, pass around the flyers, one of them became the congressman, Mickey Leland. <laughs> Oh wow! Yes, Mickey. Uh, uh, he had been hired with another guy, and and uh, he and Mickey later when I saw him in Washington, he says he said it was the other kid. He said, "Let's just dump these. I'll never know." And that was it, you know. So Mickey's mother was a school teacher, and she came in regularly. And then there, there Mickey was a son, and there was a sister. So we knew the family. Wow! So that's. <laughs> Do you keep in touch? With who? The, their family. The, I, I think they're, they're all gone. But Mickey Leland uh, died, and Congressman Wyatt was representing uh, Texas. Uh, this is a district that preceded uh, Sheila Jackson Lee. Um, he, he was on uh, an excursion or something, trip, and his plane went into the mountains in Africa, somewhere on African trip, so he died. Yeah. Mm, okay. In office. So you had mentioned that your parents uh, always had a kind of dream to to go back to China. Were they ever able to visit the village after they came here? Uh, not that I know of. I don't think they ever... No, not that I know of. I don't think they ever had the money. See, they never had... They're making a living out. They never had that, uh, um, you know... Uh, extra discretionary money to uh, go back, yeah. Have you or your siblings had a chance to visit? Oh, the siblings have. I haven't gone back China to the village. I've gone to China three times, mainland China. Uh, uh, and, no. And we also had, my mother had uh, a sister who had moved to um, Sydney, Australia, about the... Um, uh, a, a little after that, when she met my father, who brought her uh, to um, America. So even that uh, sister, my mother, uh, ever you know, would not, never saw physically again. They 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 communicated by writing letters, you know, Chinese letters in Chinese. And so I got to um, I've gotten fortunately to get to know those first cousins. Since who I had been corresponding with since I was a teenager, because I'm fortunate enough to travel now. But no, I don't. I really have no idea. I don't, I don't, it, it may have been before I was born, but I don't ever my, remember my parents being on a plane when we took trips. It was just by car. Have you, uh, has your family kept in touch with uh, the rest of the family that might be related to your mother in China, mm-hmm. who are still in China? I don't, I don't think anymore. It would be, you know, second, third generation and all. Uh, it's just, um, you know, it's was, it was mainly these two younger sisters, and the, then the younger sister was in Hong Kong. Uh, no, I, uh, no, we, you know, we have, <laughs> I have a, I have a, a booklet that was given to me of the history by my cousin in Sydney. Uh, detailing what he had been able to piece together about my mother's family from his mother um, before she died. So um, I remember that I have to pull that out and um, uh, see who I, who I need to share that with. But no, it was things that was, was um, sort of lost. Uh, but if it was happening, it was probably before I was born. Because there's a family album, black and white photos of old Chinese sitting in <laughs> chairs, these very formal pictures that were probably related to her or, or my father. And uh, I, I, uh, we don't know who, the, who they were. You know, it's, it would be the older siblings who might have recollections of them. Were you close with uh, Harry G's family? Oh yes, uh, it was. Um, 
you talking about uh, Harry G. Sr., who was one of the first to arrive here. And it was Harry G. Sr. who uh, wrote my father, I assume he wrote him, contacted my father, and said that Houston would be a good city to come to for, for Chinese. It was a growing city, and you know, not just I found me. He thought we needed to get out of Lake Village, Arkansas, and that little grocery merchant store. And there was there was prejudice there too, you know, against him in Arkansas. And uh, it wasn't until you know more recently in the um, last few years we learned my eldest sister, uh, she might have been fifteen, sixteen then. But she was due, the, she was a valedictorian of her class, and they weren't going to allow her to have the title because she was Chinese. And I don't know, all those circumstances might have prompted, well, get out of here, because she was still able to come here and uh, go to Sam Houston High School and graduate valedictorian from there. Wow. See, I remember what month I finally, but then are either valedictorians and salutatorians? Not I. <laughs> <laughs> What's the relationship between Harry G. Sr. and your father? Uh, is there, it all goes back to the village, sort of distant cousins, you know, I, the, the G's family associated. We're not blood, all blood related easily, but it goes back to generations. My, um, and, um, and I think that they're related. He may have been the uncle of uh, cousin Albert, Wallace, and Gordon. And Gordon's the only surviving brother. I have to uh, see that. But it was, you know, I, I really don't, it's just, we always called them cousin. And let's see, you have a <laughs> you've got some Yeah, he's a big chart. <laughs> so uh, do you think um, your family is blood related with Harry G. Sr.'s family? Or village, uh, I think, yeah, at least village right there. I think you track it down. You know, uh, uh, um, a cousin Lucille who just uh, died last year, uh, who was married to Wallace, she went and sat down to me. She visited me, and, um, and, and, and her son, we were, uh, her son is, we were both in Washington, D.C., and we were having lunch in Georgetown. And I asked this question. She says, I think, uh, I think we're there, uh, uh, great, great, great grandfather. <laughs> she said, I think you may have to say great, great, great grandfather. I said, Are you sure, Lucille? <laughs> That's how she traced it. Uh, I have no idea. But I know this. I accept that we're all related and that, that we're sort of a minority name. You know, we're not Wongs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, although the, the village in uh, Taoisan mm -hmm. has lots of G's. Yeah, because of, there was a, well, that village was financed by prosperous G's in this country and sent money back. And uh, my father sent money back, and there was supposed to be at the middle school or something names everybody who do donated. And he's, he's up there along with other cousins who live in Houston and sent money back. Can you talk a little bit about um, uh, your family's expectations on marriage. Uh, were you ever pressured to marry Chinese or Asian, or was it very free? Oh, uh, well, uh, it was my mother who wanted me to marry a Chinese guy. And, uh, you know, um, we would always like she, um, uh, she knew I had uh, uh, American friends I socialized with. And, uh, I tell you, one time I did date a Shanghainese guy at the University of Houston, and I brought him home, and she knew he was Shanghainese, and she didn't like him. <laughs> you know, they say village people sometimes of because Shanghainese are very business and maybe not to be trusted because they're so fine. Those are these the prejudices this is, and she knew by the way he talked. But she also made this strange comment by the shape of his eyes. She knew he was Shanghainese. Well, anyway, that aside, I'll show you. I'll show you those prejudices from the very. Oh, you come on! You tell me, Shanghainese. No, no, no. Yeah, from that point, yeah. 
Uh, but yeah, but she she didn't, and then there was a time when uh, uh, I was younger uh, when these women, older women, were trying to get their son and nephew over, but it was actually proposing to my two sisters who were uh, um, in college or just out of college coming over. But when I was young and they'd have these conversations. But my mother, at least, she never forced us. And she told us, she says, um, I can't force my daughters to do that. And, and, and they were... Um, you interviewed Marianne. Oh, did we? You know, Marianne was one of them. And then she turned to me. Well, what about her? <laughs> what was I? <laughs> Fifteen or something? <laughs> um, no, no. But uh, she, yeah, she would have preferred uh, uh, that that I uh, find a, a, a good Chinese boy, whether from um, the old country or Chinese American to have a family. But then I would, you know, I'm very, uh, uh, <laughs> a little unconventional because I, I, I didn't care about anything. I just work, I just wanted to uh, have my career and travel and have my experiences. So, uh, and I, I, I didn't have that many involvements. Uh, so I really, I really didn't marry till I was 51, okay? <laughs> I was a career person, so I'm the exception of the sisters in the family. And I met my husband in uh, San Francisco. And he's Caucasian, Royce. Mm -hmm. um, just to understand um, kind of the, the times while you were growing up, you had mentioned you, you had gone on a date with a Shanghai news person. What was a typical, what's a typical date um, back in the day in Houston? Where would, where would someone go for a date? Well, you would be well. Sometimes, if you like movies, you go you go to movies, and uh, uh, you're fortunate you uh, you go out and um, eat afterwards. Uh, but a, a a nice date is um, yeah. If you you go movies, or you would at least have a nice nice dinner the, that he pays for. You know, a whole, you know, for the menu and. Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah, I sort of you know, think that that would be you know, um, a, a nice thing. That would be a, a typical one to just go. I didn't. It wasn't until later that I was uh, I had brought in, I could brought in culturally to start attending you know ballets and and symphony and things like that. But that was typical. Or there were parties. See, for. Um, Ch uh, Chinese youth, we had parties at each other's house, and somebody could maybe pick you up and take you to the party, and you would eat there, and you dance, and all um, thing, and you'd be taking home. So that would count also as a date. But I think a, a more typical date was just going to see a movie, and and um, and they treat you to popcorn, or and sometimes you don't get a full meal afterwards. You just to go, you get to go to a coffee shop, and have. Uh, uh, pastry and coffee, and you talk. That was a very typical, you know, modest type date. It's not mm -hmm. too different. Oh, it's still the same? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> what are you going to pay? I mean, you, you're going to be McDonald's? It's got to be good. Um, did, you, did you attend very many of these Chinese house parties? Oh, yes. Yeah, there were a lot of parties. Uh, this, uh, uh, there would be my, my cousin, Janine, was having parties. They had a nice house. Uh, somewhere there was always some sort of little gatherings, and they could, you know, get together if, if not, not at a house, in a general house. Um, I guess sort of a who would be. It, you know, it was generally in the home, but but you could go to the protection um, of. Um, a rental place. Oh, they they used to have these parties at VA halls that that could, would be larger. And uh, and then by the time I was in college, to say uh, I was still at you know, I was at University of Houston. Uh, there would be gatherings I I could uh, go to, and there were international student organization. It was things that were tied to the the university that I go, we go to, but. Uh, bef yeah, probably through the high school years, there was part you know parties that were 
being ill. They were always, you know, you were protected, and uh, you had, and 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 normally, ooh, no, normally liquor generally wasn't served. It was, it was soda water and punches and things. So then you start having anything like that to the college age, but it was we were very uh, group. It was a very group socially uh, involved. What high school did you go to? Uh, Stephen F. Austin. Austin. Um, and were most of your friends um, Caucasian? Were they Asian? Were they mixed? Uh, by the time, it, the, my friends tended to be uh, more Caucasian because of my activities there, you know, being on the school paper, uh, of um, honor society. Uh, um, I was even an ROTC sponsor. Do you know what that is? Yes. Okay. Wow. Yeah, I was an ROTC sponsor. And um, so it was mainly that, all those school activities. But yeah, I have to understand, too, the Asian friends would be in a separate category. The Asian friends that you had, either related to your friends, uh, uh, and, if, and they had been maybe uh, developed to the church, and, and then outside the church would have parties. Those groups were separate. So you'd have different crowds that, uh, that you could be with. Uh, because, uh, you know, yeah, generally I didn't have all the same things in common with uh, Asian friends that I had the school, the school uh, uh, activities with. Mm -hmm. You mentioned you went to college at UH. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you major in? Um, I, um, well, I have my graduate degree from there is journalism, English, teacher education. So I had to have a double major and then take the teacher education credits the, because I decided it was good to have because for a first job, being a teacher was a good job. It paid well. So that's why I took all the education courses. What was your, how would you describe your career? <laughs> very, very uh, fluid. Uh, uh, um, it was, I, I, you know, it's very, a very fluid path. It was, you know, my tra trajectory has not been like that. It's been like this because, because I took um, positions and all because, because I in, enjoyed the work or the experiences. I wasn't, well, of course, you're always looking for promotions, so you're looking for pay increases, but if you're supporting yourself, you got to take what's out there and what's offered to you. But uh, um, but I always knew uh, when uh, when I was traveling uh, wherever I was, um, I could find work because you know I left from here. I went to uh, Honolulu and for seven years and found work there. And there was where on my journalism side, I was an editor and public relations specialist. And then from there, I went to Washington, D.C., wanting to use my skills to work for government. I stayed there nine years. And then from, from D.C., I came back over to uh, the West Coast, uh, California. And so since 85, I've lived in the state of California, first in the Bay Area, uh, outside of uh, San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley. And now, uh, um, with my husband and our retirement years, we moved down uh, 2009 to uh, Claremont, California. So, I generally, I was confident. I just always, the thing, you know, the words of my father, you need to work hard, apply yourself, get out there and look for those jobs and, and fight for them. So I knew I would, I would find something. Even when I would go to these areas and I, I didn't have anything lined up because I just had my savings that I thought I could exist on until I found the full-time job. That was always, that was my strategy, right? <laughs> what motivated you to, to kind of travel to these places to, to start anew over there? Um, because I wanted to. Uh, uh, even growing up in Houston, uh, through my, uh, you know, you know, 
wearing his shoes, uh, middle middle school, high school, and then I was in college. Um, Maybe it started more early years of high school. I just realized there was more of a world beyond Houston, Texas, and there was going to be a time when I had to leave this place and just travel because it's a big United States, and there were just too many worthwhile experiences for me. Experiences as part of learning, you know, lifelong learning, and meeting different people who don't. Uh, who are different from you and bring different life experiences, uh, whether they disagree with you. You know, I don't have to be, I, I enjoy that. That's why at the U of H, I, I sought out being part of the international students because I wanted to learn from them and I wanted to, to be with them. So I knew it. So then um, by the time I'd finished graduate from University of Houston, and then I said, okay, I'll go ahead and teach at Galena Park. And then after one year, I was. A little tired of teaching already. <laughs> and these were the good days, right? The, the, the biggest issues were don't wear too much makeup and have your skirts too short. Um, or you had to go see the dean. Um, and even I, as a teacher, had my skirts too short, so the dean had to talk to me. And um, so in that, I, I decided to take a, a vacation to visit my sister in Honolulu. It was during the summer. And I uh, said, okay, I want to I want to go. And Oh, to go to Hawaii for the first time, so multicultural and so free, where people are proud of their heritage and, you know, they, they accept you and very tolerant of the lifestyle. I fell in love with the place, and, and uh, uh, I had, uh, had always kept up my professional organization, so what you do, you look up, you look up the chapters in these areas, if it's an um, editing group, if it's a public relations group, uh, women in communications, uh, and uh, their contacts there, and and you make and um, you know it's a, it's a sort of networking, and they'll tell you what the jobs were available. So I started looking for jobs, and uh, and. Uh, but I had to, you know, sign it, and, and uh, within two weeks I had a job. And then, so I did. I just wired my school district because I had, I had, was not obligated uh, having only taught. After one year, I would have had to sign a contract. So I was open, and you just wire and say, "I'm not, I'm not coming back," and <laughs> you're gonna get a new teacher. <laughs> Hire a new teacher. What were you teaching? English. To, yeah. to which, which, uh, what kind of students? I was junior, it was junior and seniors. Uh, I was, they hired three teachers, one white, one black, and one Asian or Chinese. And I think that was intentional uh, attempt at diversity because, you know, Texas took its time in integrating. And it was the first few years they were accepting blacks at this high school. So that's when I noticed the black students, you know there. So I think that was intentional. But I was the oldest of the three, so they gave me juniors and seniors to teach. And they already had a journalism teacher who I knew from college. So. <laughs> Did you continue to be a teacher in Honolulu? No. I've never gone back. I, I've just gone into my field, uh, journalism, and uh, which has been led me to, you know, uh, all, first off, first um, uh, 13, 14 years, I was a writer and editor in, uh, and also in a public relations practitioner. I would get these jobs and say, you know, public relations, you know, you know director, you know, slash editor, stuff like that. So I utilized my skills in, in that area because I could uh, edit, there was a newsletter to edit and produce brochures uh, for the organization. And then I developed public relations context. What do you think has been your most meaningful experience? Oh my, how very, what a, what a difficult uh, You mean one experience in a well, job? Uh, or you, you, you mentioned that um, <sighs> you, you really valued experience. Um, that's what motivated you to, to travel around, to try new things. What, which, is there a particular experience that you think back most fondly of? Well, that's, I think it'd be more the early jobs. I've had, um, 
a lot a number of, I've had I've had a lot of jobs and then they have been uh, they have been difficult and challenging. They're all generally under pressure because uh, you're meeting deadlines, you know, in producing your products. And then when I also, in Washington, I got into, um, I worked for a, a, a higher education group where I took on a responsibility to be a part-time half development director and then the, uh, the public information director. So doing all these publications, and uh, and some PR activities, uh, issuing press releases, etc. But the development side is the fundraising side, raising the monies for the um, the nonprofit um, organization. And it was the organization for small colleges, which are your uh, smaller, uh, 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 you know, sectarian groups. Your St. Mary's, St. John's, New Hampshire. I think I mean I think even Washington University in St. Louis for a while. Anyway, uh, so there I learned fundraising and how and I applied my skills to start writing proposals to to uh, bring in money for the group and that there's that's what I moved into the area after writing and editing, editing because there was more call for being a fundraiser in nonprofits. So then the pressures became. Um, uh, even greater, because I would be under pressure to raise money to keep the organization uh, financially uh, viable. So I would say early on, uh, maybe when I was still an editor, I uh, I got a, a, a my first job in Honolulu was for the Hawaii Heart Association, which is a nonprofit, you know, um, it's a large nonprofit health group. And but you, you know, you have to, you you educate, advocate for uh, um, uh, um, education, educating people about heart disease. But uh, because uh, I uh, I was so new there, and I had some new experiences, and I had a very round way, uh, round well-rounded um, uh, opportunities to uh, develop my skills, not just writing. And editing brochures, I had to make contacts with the radio stations, the TV stations. I had to have contacts with the newspapers. Um, I had to uh, maintain my professional organizations uh, and all that. So it was very well rounded, and, and it was a very le uh, learning experience. And I had support from my boss. He just he just thought I was doing a great job, and he he, he would pay. He would pay for all my memberships in these groups because he saw, saw it that it was advantageous uh, for the organizations. So I find throughout my, year, my life's experiences and career, whenever I am in new to something and I have new challenges and I'm learning and I'm growing, then I feel better. I feel that I'm not doing the same routine thing. I think I have a somewhat low threshold for boredom. So I've had to, you know, just keep <laughs> doing these things. <laughs> I didn't want to do things things over and over. Some people more comfortable and then, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what year did you leave Houston again? 1969. Do you have any memories of the civil rights movement? Oh, yes, yes. Oh, sure. We were watching it at, uh, on, uh, on uh, television and, yeah. Uh, uh, the news. I, I wasn't active then, and it was just, you know, horrible seeing. Uh, I always very sympathetic with, uh, with uh, black people, and and uh, seeing them, you know, sprayed uh, by water and hoses. I remember those vividly on TV. So then, and uh, then, uh, but I didn't really. You see, I was in. Hawaii, then when Hawaii was from 69 to 76, and of course, I kept, you know, up with that, uh, of, um, of, uh, uh, of what was happening, and also part of those later years in Hawaii, I was developing my feminism because I had women who were or were early feminists in in, the, or in who were uh, communicators that made friends. So it wasn't until moving to Washington 
that I really took on more of the activists' leanings, and there it was uh, on behalf of Asian Americans uh, working in government and, and all, and, and then uh, I headed an organization for uh, Pan-Asian American women, and then I helped co-found an organization with um, uh, uh, other uh, women of color, uh, black, uh, Hispanic, Asian. That we were we were Chinese and Japanese mainly, and uh, Native American. So there, because I, I was an activist, I became. I became more more committed, but still, it was it was um, yeah, it was probably during toward the end. Uh, yeah, real it's really uh, yeah, more toward the end of the actual civil rights. But there was a, a period of of um, t uh, where uh, uh, affirmative action and uh, civil rights were prevalent um, under the court administration. So that was it was a favorable period politically for us until Reagan came in, <laughs> which we thought was bad then, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Daniel, do you have any questions? Oh uh, yeah. So kind of going back to your older siblings, mm -hmm. you were talking about how they they did some of the instilling of values in you. They would tell you like, oh, that's you can't do that. Yeah, that's uh, what other parental roles did they take on? Like, um, I know they helped in the store. Did they like cook or drive you around? Things like that. Oh yes, I couldn't. Uh, you know, the brothers because uh, I didn't get my license till I was nineteen. So the brothers had to drive us around to uh, uh, activities. Um, Actually, you know, it's so. I was so independent, uh, at so young, when it was my uh, my two older sisters who would literally buy my clothes. But then, you know, by the time my my um, and and things. Oh, here's the other thing, right? Clothes were passed down from my two other sisters by my mother, and to me. Okay, and then. Uh, once my sisters, because uh, the sister closest to me it was my, um, uh, the brothers. There are four brothers between uh, me and Marianne. So Marianne's eight years older than I. So they're off, you know, college already. So I'm 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 at home and uh, still in my what uh, uh, you know um, middle years, right? Um, middle you know junior high school years, and also. I'm I'm very independent, so I can go uh, uh, when I uh, started having a little money. You know, I I can go buy my clothes at Woolworths, you know, places like that, and buy my very first heels, little things. So I you know when I said so other because I was I was tired of the hand me downs, and then I you know I, I, I so I could buy my own clothes. Um, no, it was just it would just be big sister talk. I mean, they they, I, I, they didn't have to be that protective uh, of me. I think they just had to keep me in line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then um, I know George went on to open some of his own businesses. Did mm -hmm. you ever uh, work with those? Or mm -hmm. he also worked in a restaurant. Oh yes, I was very involved. <laughs> Uh, once George uh, turned the grocery store over to my brother Johnny, who had come out of the army to run, uh, he had some jobs, and he would be the manager of my cousin Albert's restaurant. Uh, my cousin Albert G. introduced is, is noted for introducing Cantonese cooking to Houston. Oh, really? Yeah, his old Ding Hao restaurant was very famous. Well, then he opened uh, a poly Asian, a very sophisticated poly Asian restaurant. It was very nice, you know, you know, um, the dark tropical thing, the mai tais and everything, and sitting on the mats and everything. It was, it was upscale, and so he was the manager. So I would get recruited to go help, help mm -hmm. him, uh, and mainly it was to be the hostess. To help seat them, and and also when the 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 young guy didn't show up to park the cars, 
I had to part the cards. Yeah. I'd so how old were you for this? I, well, I was in, uh, I was probably about um, 18, 19. Oh, okay. Yeah, you because know, I was college age, and you know, I was still here, you know, so, so that venture. So I was always on call. And part time, I had been uh, living in with, with them for a bit when I was going to UH, and then in my junior, senior years, I moved out to an apartment with two other uh, 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 gals. And then he, uh, he, he had an export-import business, and I can't remember where it was. And sometimes I would get recruited to go out there and help him in that business. It was always like, Marguerite, I need you. Come. <laughs> okay. Big Brother said he needed me, and uh, it, was, it, was, um, it, was, it was my responsibility to help. So... I did, <laughs> and then he eventually got into the insurance business where he really, he really was successful. Mm -hmm. But he had those two. I remember he had these two little in home positions, jobs until he um, um, got into insurance. And that's something. Mm -hmm. What do you do for hobbies? <laughs> I'm not a real, you know, I'm not into to, to sports. Uh, I, uh, uh, and I never had uh, really, you know, big hobbies like knitting, sewing, anything like that. I'm, I, I tend to be more active and uh, I have interests. I, I love going to movies. I still go to movies. Um, they're, um, they're cultural activities. Uh, uh, my husband, um, my husband and I go into uh, opera and uh, theater in um, L.A. We drive in there. I, I, I like the cultures. Um, so, so I don't have any, you know, any with, uh, conventional uh, uh, hobbies that like women my age <laughs> might have because I was never good at knitting and crocheting and stuff like that. And I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fairly good cook. You know, I can cook Chinese dishes and other foods. Uh, um, listen, it's a, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's a lot. And I, I, uh, I don't lead a sedentary life. I try to I exercise, you know, I, I try to get out and exercise. Uh, I belong to a gym, uh, but I do walk uh, two to three times a week and then go to a gym um, to, Keep keep my muscles is up, so to be active. But I am um, well. My interest see or now volunteering in the community, and I'm I'm um, I'm quite active politically in Claremont with the Claremont Democratic Club. So uh, we are very right we act, uh, active right now. I'm part of the resistance. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> we are taking on projects and. Uh, um, <clears throat> Uh, toward to uh, to uh, uh, run Democrats against some of the uh, uh, Republicans in Stone's districts, and uh, I do for the club number of activities, and uh, one uh, one of them is um, I do a RRT stands for Rapid Response Team, where I have people through emails, I alert them of issues, national issues, and. Uh, and also issues only in California that they need to take action on and and um, uh, contact their MOCs, members of Cong uh, uh, Congress. You know your two senators, your uh, your your um, your representative, and then California you have an assembly person and you have a local senator. So this is to influence on the issues that are important to us and. Of course, right now, immigration is a very important issue mm -hmm. for us. So I spend a lot of my, my time now doing these kind of things. Then I volunteer with the senior center, and I have a group of friends there and, and do just a little volunteer work at, uh, called upon the senior center and doing mailings and, and um, um, getting their newsletters out so I know a group of women there. And at Claremont uh, College, 
uh, I participate within the with the international students, and it's called I Place International Place, and they have various programs, and I have. I really curtail my activities now, so what I do is I take on at least one um, international or foreign student who wants to improve his or her English. And mainly they're Asian students, they're, they're, they're Chinese, they're Japanese, they're Korean, they, at least they sign those to me, but we only, we only you know, speak Chinese. So that really is what occupies my time. <laughs> you know, it's almost like a, 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 um, part-time work because mm -hmm. you know, when you're, you're a volunteer, you, that's those are the things I can. And then, then there are there are my 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 cultural activities and breaks. And then I oh I travel with my husband who travels a lot. Um, and uh, we yeah uh, we just got back from uh, Jerusalem before we came here. And uh, um, no, what else we do? Yeah, the, the the cultural activities when and I you know arrange for the tickets or the symphony concerts and things like that. We go to and then check out good eating places, new good eating places that are, that are near us or uh, uh, well, around you now. Before coming back to Houston, I go on Yelp and I check out, I check out the new Mexican and barbecue places so we could try them. Wonderful. Yes. So that keeps me busy. I, yeah, mean, I'm, I'm, I slow busy. down, I slow down some. I'm not as active as I really used to be, but you know, I, I can do something. That's great. You just reminded <laughs> me of uh, two more questions I had. Uh -huh. um, you said when you were younger, with basically every meal you had white rice mm -hmm. and at least one Chinese vegetable. Mm -hmm. How important are is Chinese food to you in your diet today? Uh, it's it's not something I have to, uh, every day. No, it is. Uh, I, I will have these dishes, and we go out for. Uh, special meals and particularly go out for dim sum but my diet is just um, it's probably more Mediterranean I want to keep it very healthy mm -hmm. I don't eat white rice until we go out I eat brown I cook brown rice quinoa and couscous so that I move that around the green health grains uh, with what we're having either uh, if it's a uh, uh, broad uh, chicken Jim, my husband Jim doesn't like much meat. I have to have a pork chop every so now. I don't eat much beef. It's chicken or, um, or or turkey. I make I use ground turkey for my pasta instead of I have very little beef. Uh, so I will cook pasta and I always have if it's chicken, uh, a, a seafood I always seafood shrimp. Uh, 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 fish about twice a week. He loves fish, so it's salmon and what you buy the market. Um, but uh, you know, it's not. Yeah, it's. I have different sauces if I'm baking in the oven. But generally, when I go buy a fresh fish at um, Ranch Ninety Nine, I steam it. I cook it the Chinese way. Yeah. So certain things are kind of yeah, a stir fry. No, but I do not have to have Chinese food every day. You know, it's just like um, the feeling uh, every so often. Yeah. You know, well, you know, Chinese food, and then the really good restaurants are not close to us. Okay. But sometimes, if I'm really craving something fast, I go to Panda Express. <laughs> <laughs> you got that time. Right. <laughs> but, um, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, it's not, it's not yeah. Uh, yeah, Panda. so my other question was, you said you married when you were 51. Mm -hmm. um, what... How did you meet your husband? How did you decide, like, now's the time to get married and stop focusing so much on my career or your career? Yeah, I guess, it was, you know, it was, well, I was, I'm not going to be able to tell you uh, exactly all the circumstances since this is what for posterity after I'm gone. Uh, uh, but it was, was it some sort of a, it wasn't exactly a dating service or something like that, saving, see, looking for partners for compatibility and uh, given uh, my characteristics because I was, uh, I was looking for uh, someone who'd be compatible with me where I could start having 
having a, a dinner companion, companion to have conversation with. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of places, restaurants, sometimes you don't, sometimes they don't, you don't feel comfortable or they don't make you feel comfortable if you're eating alone. And then you, if you can find a, a female friend, and they always put you at the worst tables too, you know. So, so I wanted a, 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 a first thing, I just wanted male companionship, and I had, uh, it, it, at the time, I had almost resigned myself to being single. I said, I'll just, you know, try it. So he was one of the people who responded, and it, um, through his message and all, we agreed to meet. And what is, well, okay, you know, we, we go, you're doing good at that age to find a man who would pay for his share of the coffee or pay for your coffee. You know, he'll pay for his coffee. <laughs> So he was treating me to dinner. He took me to a Thai restaurant. So I thought that was pretty that this man is going to treat me to dinner. And we went to a Thai restaurant and then had, you know, uh, conversations, started talking. And um, uh, he was a uh, philosophy, philosophy professor at San Francisco State. So I said, oh, he's employed. And, <laughs> well, okay. Don't worry, and he's taking me out to dinner. Because, you know, I'm, I'm a single woman, a queer woman, you pretty much are paying your way uh, uh, a lot of these things. And at that age, sometimes, at an age, if, if single men you might meet are somewhat losers, you know. <laughs> They're not going to pay for anything. So, so I was impressed. We had good conversations. Uh, he's, 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 he's shy. He's an introvert. And the fact that he has interests in Asian uh, um, culture. Uh, he, um, he, um, oh, he's multilingual, he's a scholar, uh, he, he, um, he, uh, he can read and write some Japanese, and through that he, he's picked up kanji, he can read more Chinese than I can. Uh, and he's traveled to Japan on business, and so I would go to Japan with him. He uh, belonged to the Asian Art Museum. We both belonged there, and they would go to events together. So he loves uh, the uh, bronze at the Asian Art. So we had things in common. And he was, because he loves Asian culture, I think he could, he, he would be attracted to an Asian woman, and we would have things in common. And he had uh, an Asian friends. So, it, it developed, it just developed. We started, we, we knew each other for uh, uh, two, yeah, two full years before, uh, he was divorced, and before um, we decided to uh, get married. Wonderful. <laughs> okay. Did you have any other questions? No, I'm good. Uh, well, that was all that I had, so thank you so much for your time. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> So what do we, we uh, uh, well, you're going to take me to the archives. Right.